pre-COVID, which for churches, you have to understand, is outstanding. It is absolutely outstanding. There's no other church that we connect with who's having like 90% return to their services. So you guys are just doing phenomenal well. So be kind to yourself. Number two, you don't have to have all the answers. And that, you know, Isaiah 46, verse 6, um, the Bible says, or God's speaking, only I can tell you the future before it even happens. So you don't need to be Nostradamus. You don't need to be Isaiah. You don't need to be the prophet who knows everything. So saying I don't know doesn't mean I don't care. So we've got to be okay with saying to people, oh, I just don't know. I don't have the answer for that. Uh, it's okay not to have answers to everyone's questions. As a leader, doesn't have to know everything. In fact, sometimes it's really important for you to actually say that you don't know because sometimes you can fall into the trap uh, of saying that you do know or making something up that's wrong. And <laughs> that's worse than saying, I don't know the answer to that. So be careful. I'm guilty of this. I often just try and think of my feet and say, give an answer and it's just wrong. And it, makes, it, it means it's in the future I've got to unravel a whole mess I've just created for myself. <laughs> so... So don't, uh, so don't, so be okay with saying I don't know. You don't have to have all the answers. Also, on that point, don't fall into the trap of answering questions that nobody's asking. Because sometimes in crisis, we think we have to just keep talking and keep saying things, and we answer all these questions nobody's even caring about, or no one's even asking. You know, like we we would stop, and I think we might have even done this. We just stopped rostering some people on, you know, because they were struggling at home. This was even pre-COVID. They're having relationship problems with their spouse at home, and we just thought oh, we'll give them some time off. In fact, what they wanted was they wanted to be rostered on more to serve so they could, um, so their partner would encourage them to come to church. And so we got it backwards. Like we answered a question. We thought the question was, um, can you let me serve less because I've got some problems at home? The actual question was, how can you help me serve more so that I can be released to be a part of church because it's good for me and my family? So let's not just start making up questions and answering them that people aren't even asking. You know, and a whole, um, a whole org example of that is that, you know, we were, when uh, COVID happened, we were launching a financial, uh, you know, our, our finance series. And because COVID hit, we knew that no one's asking the question about, you know, how do I build my finance at the moment? Everyone just wants to know, like, what's happening tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so we totally changed the whole organisation's messaging because we needed to start answering the questions that people were actually asking and not just um, getting stuck on, you know, answering questions that no one was asking. So you don't have to have all the answers and don't, don't answer questions that nobody's asking. Number three, cast clear, compelling and unwavering vision. Proverbs 28, 29, 18, Proverbs 29, 18 speaks so well to this point. It says that if people can't see what God is doing, this is from the message paraphrase, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. So other versions say where there's no clear vision, um, you know, people cast off restraint vision helps people to stay on track and so vision when it's compelling when it's clear it keeps teams together it keeps families together it keeps communities together it keeps nations moving forward we've seen you know um, australia and other nations when there's a clear compelling vision for the future about particularly what's happening in this crisis the covid crisis it helps us to keep on track it gives us clear uh, vision for the future that if we do these things then we're going to move forward together so Keep casting our clear, compelling vision. As, as Beyond Church, our vision is very simple <clears throat> and we need to keep calling, calling people and casting the vision of Beyond Church because even though things have changed, our direction hasn't changed and even though times have changed, our vision hasn't changed and even if we're in the middle of a crisis, even if it's post-COVID and another crisis arises, which inevitably will, the way through crisis is to stay faithful to our calling and stay faithful to the vision. So, and if it's if it's compelling, the vision and how you articulate it needs to be compelling. It shouldn't get old, irrespective of the circumstances. So, no matter how um, uh, impending and uh, and how uh, catastrophic the crisis is, it should never overpower how compelling the vision is. So, we need to we need to be asking ourselves that question: Am I communicating the vision in a way that it is compelling? That it that it drowns out the noise. Um, and drowns out the distraction of the crisis is it because it should always inspire you and if, if you're not inspired by the vision you know there needs to be a way in which you can be um, you know refueled and refired and reinvigorated about what it is that you're doing take the time you need to take to make sure that you're ready to cast clear compelling and unwavering vision for the sake of the people that you're leading so cast clear compelling vision number four call people to the culture i want to give some specifics on this because i think it's really helpful for us when we say call people to the culture 
that's really just two things. It's correcting things that are countercultural and also celebrating when people are culturally aligned with Beyond Church and where we're going. So when correcting countercultural um, or a cultural misalignment, I want to just emphasise this point. So when things aren't how they should be in the middle of crisis, please remember to be soft on the person but hard on the issue. So when you're correcting culture, be soft on the person but hard on the issue. So an issue might be, you know, using the wrong language from the platform. You know, it might be not keeping the dress code. It might be being chronically late to meetings. It might be not being able to bring a good report or, or always bringing a bad report. So the way that we deal with that is that we know, we say to the person, hey, we know that you actually are a great person and we know that you actually do want to lead well and you want to be an excellent team player. So how can we work together to correct this issue? Because this issue isn't who we are. And we can be clear about the issue. We can be hard on the issue, but we can be soft on the person. So, you know, when we add the issue here, let's say chronically late, you know, that says that we don't value something about the culture. But it doesn't mean we don't value the person. So if the person's, you know, not valuing the fact that we want to love each other and care for each other and prefer each other, um, that doesn't mean we have to be hard on the person because they're not upholding the value. It means we need to be clear about the value not being upheld and the issue needs to be dealt with, but we have to be really soft on the person that we're dealing with. So that's how we, that's just a very simple way when, it, when we're talking about calling people to the culture, how to correct counter, counter-cultural or, counter, or cultural misalignment. The second point there is celebrate cultural alignment. So let's make sure that in crisis, we are celebrating people all the time. Celebrate the person and, and just you know, pour into them, you know, generous, um, you know, be effusive, be like over the top with how amazingly they're holding to the things that we value and champion them for doing that. So call people to the culture, really important in crisis. And fifth, the people you are with, sorry, the people with you are with you. So lead with confidence. And I've really struggled with this over the years and I still struggle with it today. Just to remember that the people who are with you me, the people who are with you, the people who are on your team or in your room, they're actually with you. If they weren't with you, they wouldn't be with you. So you can lead with confidence with the people that you have. You know, Hebrews 10.35 says, don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. So where people are leaning in, you can lead with confidence. And where people are leaning out or stepping back, you don't need to be heavily invested into leading people who aren't uh, a part of where you're going or or, um, you know, be part of your team or in the room. And what, I, what I'll say to that is that you can only lead to the level of permission. So if some people uh, are kind of are reluctant to be a part of what you're doing or they kind of have um, reservations about how you're you know, leading your team or reservations about how you're participating as a team member or, you know, they're reluctant to, to do the things that you'd like them to do, there's no point, you know, trying to... Uh, you know, get, there's no point being discouraged about that or trying to force that issue because you can only really lead to the level of permission. If someone's inviting you to speak into their life, it's a lot easier. But if someone's constantly saying no or not willing to, you know, be a team player, we've got to be okay with that and not get frustrated with that. And I'll just finish on this point with this um, uh, being confident about leading people that are with you. Don't get frustrated with those who aren't coming with you don't get frustrated with the people who aren't in the room you know don't get frustrated with the team member who doesn't show up or don't get frustrated with the team member who's not playing their part or don't get frustrated with the um you know with the students that decide to uh, you know unenroll from the academy or don't get frustrated with because if you are frustrated with all the people who aren't with you that bleeds out into the people who are with you so if you are frustrated with the people who aren't in the church service or aren't in your life group or you're frustrated with people who aren't turning up or aren't responding to your text messages, then that frustration bleeds into all the people who are with you in the room. They want the person who in the room who loves it that that they're there with them. They don't want to have to deal with frustrated John or frustrated leader Andrew because no one else is here with him. So lead with who you've got. They're with you. They love you. So lead with confidence and don't be frustrated with the people who aren't with you or aren't giving them permission to lead them as you'd like to. So second last, uh, this is probably the, probably the most important one, is guard your spiritual disciplines. Because in, in crisis, it's probably, it's probably the easiest time for us to just get really relaxed about those disciplines that we know really do build our life and keep us stable and keep us strong and keep us healthy for others. 
So guard your spiritual disciplines is when we say spiritual, we're actually still talking about the whole person, uh, which is physical you know, and spiritual, you know, your emotional life. And there are some really practical things that we can do that help to guard our spiritual disciplines. And I remember through crisis, I was on a location leader call with um, our friends from uh, Life Church in Brisbane. And one of the things that uh, Pastor Jeff said uh, to just encourage his team with, and you know, we, we're kind of like a fly on the wall in that meeting. And you know, he's got some great leaders that are leading some significant things. And you know, he gets great advice too from other great leaders from around the world. And you know, he said one thing that we should be doing in this crisis is to keep ourselves uh, healthy. And first and foremost, keep ourselves physically healthy. He said, just make sure, and particularly because it was locked down and it was, we weren't allowed to go out and you know, we weren't even allowed to go to the gym or anything like that. He was just telling his team to make sure they kept moving, like just keep active, you know, go for a walk or you know, go for a run or get up and move around. Um, being physically active and physically healthy is actually really key um, to be able to lead with um, strength through crisis. So keep moving. Like if you want to be spiritually healthy, you can't separate spirituality from your physicality. We are one person. And so your health, your physical health is really important. So I'm not talking about being a, you know, uh, an athlete running 50 Ks every week or whatever. I'm just talking about keep moving. So if you've got the opportunity to move, move um, and keep your, you know, keep yourself active. Um, so keep moving, eat well. Like if you, like, there's no reason why in our world that we can't eat well, um, sleep well and rest well. Um, you know, do what you need to do to make sure you get enough sleep, whatever that is for you, and make sure you're taking the breaks you need to, to keep yourself physically rested, emotionally, mentally rested. Um, do, the, do the simple things like, you know, in our church, we do uh, encourage our leaders to do words to live by. You can Google that. Um, or whatever it is for you, your daily devotional time, whatever that is for you. you know, if, if it's reading the Bible for a certain amount of time a day or if it's just some prayer time per day, whatever that is, um, do that. Make sure you keep that discipline locked in. These are the these are the important things. They're more important than getting the stuff done, because if you aren't healthy, none of that none of that gets done. So you have to really start here, um, guarding your spiritual disciplines. Stay in your small group, your life group, um, for yourself. I know you you know you're leading or you're on a team, whatever. It doesn't matter. Like the, you need a life group and you need to be in it, because um, like I said, if you're in a life group and there's people with you, they're with you. Like they're there to support you and help you and help you move forward in your life. So do that and be where other people are to be receiving, you know, faith-filled experiences like being in church services. And, you know, as leaders, often we take that for granted. So when we're in a church service, let's try not to see it as, as much as uh, work as it is for us to experience the presence of God and an encounter and experience with God. So sure, we lead, but we've got to get in the practice of being able to lead and at the same time experience what it is to be in corporate worship. Um, and finally, uh, in terms of guarding your spiritual disciplines, uh, I recommend a, a good book. I've recommended it before. It's called People Fuel by uh, John Townsend. It's really good. Um, and it talks about keeping your uh, people tank full. And there's some people that drain your tank and some people that fill your tank. So make sure you're spending the right um, amount of time with the right kind of people. So, you know, if um, you've got people in your life that really pump up your tyres, make sure you spend time with them. If you've got people in your life that really suck the life out of you, just measure your time with them in crisis. Uh, and then finally, and I, I would have liked to have said this was the most important point, but it's just the most important point for me, and that is have fun. Uh, Nehemiah 8.10 says, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And at the end of the day, like we, it, we, this will fuel you, you know, like nothing else. So make sure that you take the time you need to take to have fun and to enjoy you know, life. Because, again, if you're not healthy, if you're not doing well, then nothing you lead is going to be doing well. Everything that you do, everything that you put your life into is only going to be as enjoyable as you are. So you have to be able to find a way to enjoy life and have fun. So, I, I, you know, whatever that is for you, you need to make sure that there's time for it. You know, I know that Andrew and Richard like riding their motorbikes. Uh, you know, I know that uh, Natalie likes to enjoy home-cooked delicacies from her husband. She finds a lot of joy in that. I know Sam, he likes to just annoy me. That's one of the things that he finds really fun to do. But whatever it is uh, for you, if it's playing the piano like Rebecca, uh, she, she loves that, a bit of Rachmaninoff or a bit of Mozart or something. Do whatever you need to do to have fun so that through crisis you, you're coming out stronger um, and you're not drained. So 
that's um that's it. Those are the seven things. Hopefully you've got them jotted down. Hopefully it was some practical ways to apply those seven things because we are still really leading through crisis right now. Um, things aren't what they were and inevitably crisis will come again. So hopefully that's helpful. But what I wanted to do as we wrap up, so we've got a couple minutes left, I just wanted to pray for us um, as we move into our week um, because I'm just really thankful. I just want to kind of pray and just, you know, thank God for where he has positioned our church and the, the people that he's drawn around the life of Beyond Church. So I want to pray. And if, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to pray. We're not going to, we're not going to have a prayer meeting because you know, prayer meetings don't really work on, on Zoom, but I just want to pray for you. So um, I'll do that and then we can head off into our week. Jesus, I thank you for this amazing group of people. I thank you for what you've called us to. I thank you, God, that we get to be a part of your great rescue plan for this world. Lord God, I just want to thank you for each and every one of these leaders and team members and um, these amazing people that have said yes to the call of God in their life. Uh, I just pray that right now that you would do your work in them to encourage them, to inspire them. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would um, re-energise them, uh, revitalise their, their faith life. Lord God, I just pray that um, the season that our church and our leaders move into is a season of expectation of your miracle working power in and through their life um, for the local church to continue to grow and continue to reach communities and to continue to see lives changed and people saved and brought into your kingdom um, for your name's sake. So, Lord God, I just pray that as we move into this week, that it would be a productive week, um, not just getting things done, but growing uh, in our relationship with you and with each other. And that as we move into the things that we've got to get done this week, that we would just see your hand at work in each and every aspect of all we're doing. So, Lord God, we pray for your divine favour on all that we're accomplishing. We thank you that our theme for this year, your favour will fall like rain on our surrendered lives, like showers reviving the earth. I thank you that it's been true for many of us already, even despite the crisis that we've had to uh, work through. And I pray that it will continue to be the truth for our year this year, that there would be favour on all that we do and our lives would be full and rich uh, and that we will continue to grow into what you've called us to. And just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. I won't keep you any longer. You can Bye, get back into your, into your life and do what you've got to do. You're doing Thanks, better. Thanks, guys. Bye.